When she entered my office, I thought she was lost. Not many people come to me without calling and making an appointment first. There are even fewer who come alone. And no one ever looked like her. Tall and lithe, with immaculately straight brown hair styled in an elegant long updo, she looked to be in her mid-thirties, although it was hard to tell from her flawless skin and delicate features. She was definitely several years younger than me. Her pale blue eyes quickly scanned my office from left to right, as if cataloging its contents to form an initial impression. When her eyes finished scanning and settled on mine, I felt like I was being scrutinized just as closely. Mr. Weber? I leaned back from the microscope and rose from the table. Yes? Can I help you with something? Hope so. I bought a painting that I think may be a fake. I hope you can tell if I'm right. Straight to the point. I already liked her. I'll be glad to try. No offense, Mr. Weber, but I expect more from you. I'm here because I was told that you are the best. And who told you that? She smiled. Almost all. But I'm sure you know this. Almost? She didn't take the bait. Almost. So you won't tell me the name of that poor, misguided soul who tried to direct you to someone else? No, I don't think I'll tell you. Doesn't matter. I can guess who. And please call me Adam. She walked up to my desk and extended her hand. Karina. Nice to meet you, Karina. Tell us about this picture. We moved to the rest area in my lab. Several mismatched chairs arranged haphazardly around a small wooden conference table with one wobbly leg. It was about a portrait of a tenant farmer by William Aiken Walker, which she had purchased from a small gallery in Boston eight years earlier. The artist's name didn't surprise me. In the mid-1990s, there was a fairly widespread case of counterfeiting of some of Walker's lesser works, but the date of purchase did. Most of my clients come to me before or shortly after a purchase. You bought it eight years ago. Why bring it to me now? The more works I collected, the more something seemed wrong about this. Sorry, I do not know how to explain. Understand, it often starts with intuition. Let's figure it out. I hesitated before continuing. You, of course, understand that most galleries and auction houses, at least those with which I work most often, offer a deferment for returns only about, yes, I know that too much time has passed for me to return the money if it is fake. At least she knows what she's getting into. So, are you sure you still want to know? She tilted her head and stared at me with her stunning blue eyes. Don't you want to? She asked. I am not a collector. Yes, but if you were. I paused before answering. Sometimes I wonder, if I actually really liked the piece, would it matter? Before Michelangelo became Michelangelo, he made money by forging ancient Roman sculptures. He broke off parts, buried the sculpture in the garden, and then declared that he had discovered a masterpiece. One day, a cardinal realized that the sculpture he had bought was a fake. Instead of getting angry and throwing the artist in prison, he was so impressed by his talent that he invited him to Rome. She raised an eyebrow. It sounds like you're trying to talk me out of doing business with you. I laughed. Not at all. Believe me, I will gladly take your money. I have my eye on an infrared microscope with a Fourier transformer. Amazing device, but damn expensive. Every bit of money matters. I will be happy to contribute. It will take me a few weeks. Send me everything you have about the origin and I will write an estimate. Send the picture here and I'll get to work. I started to rise from my seat, but then decided to throw caution to the wind. Or you can always bring it yourself, I added. She looked at me in confusion. Why do I need it? I instantly felt half a meter shorter. There was no good reason why she would bring a painting worth almost $6,000 to my office. I didn't know what to say, but I spoke anyway, the words falling out before I had time to process them. I just meant it would be easier. Actually, I don't know. I shrugged, giving up. She watched my thrashing with an amused grin and then said, Oh, I thought maybe you would like to see me again. 
She seemed to enjoy the stunned expression on my face for just a moment before turning to the door. I was left watching the seductive sway of I offered to meet at a place more convenient for her, but she insisted that my laboratory suited her. She arrived ten minutes before her 4 p.m. appointment, wearing a blue pencil skirt and a white button-down blouse. There was a painting on the conference table. I took a chair opposite the painting, and she sat directly opposite me. I placed two printed copies of my report on the table and pushed one towards her. I splurged on a fancy binding. She glanced at the cover of the report, folding her hands in her lap, then looked back at me. So, what's the verdict? Her voice was calm, without a trace of concern about the results of my investigation. Perhaps she realized that I did not ask her to meet me in person to deliver good news. Or maybe she was so rich that she didn't care. It's fake, I said. I've learned that when delivering bad news, it's best to be direct. One of the best I've ever seen, but still a fakey. I watched her face for signs of surprise, disappointment, or anger. She sat stoically and nodded. It's clear. And how did you find out about this? Well, everything seems to be in order with the origin. All documentation is masterfully done, likely bas on documents from Walker's other works with minor modifications. I assume that the forger even used Antica type readers. It's certainly vague enough to raise a suspicions, but there are no obvious catches. She looked ahead attentively while I spoke, placing her hand on the table and her chin between the fingers of her right hand. The frame is also at the highest level, I continued. I turned the painting over and ran the stylus along the edges. The wood was probably recovered from old pieces of furniture. It is reasonable to think of an artist active in the early 1900s. It is much more difficult to find suitable wood if you imitate the work of an old master. I turned the painting over and used a stylus to imitate the movement of a brush on the canvas. The brush strokes are well done corresponding to what can be found in most of Walker's works. The signature matches, although this is not surprising, given that this is the easiest element to fake, and the pigments are almost perfect. Almost, she asked. I smiled. Almost. I pointed to small white clouds in the distance. She leaned forward to see where I was pointing and then decided she wanted a better view. She stood up and walked around the table, taking the chair next to mine. She moved forward and sideways, ending up so close to me that her right leg was lightly resting on my left. She leaned over the painting and stared at the clouds. I conducted a chemical analysis of scrapings from various areas. Here the forger's knowledge was enough to use lead-white paint, just like Walker. This is how the first falsifiers of Walker's works were caught. Instead of lead, they used zinc-white. And here... I pointed to the yellowish strands of grass at the foot of the paintings. Do you see this yellow color? It is chemically very similar to the yellow pigment that Walker used in most of his work. But the match is not exact. This particular variety of pigment is called Hansa Gelb, named after the German company that produced it. She turned to me with a skeptical look. It seems a little different. Of course, one cannot expect that the artist used the same pigment in all his works. I can believe he had more than one kind of yellow. Absolutely true, I said. However, I did some research into the history of this pigment, and it turns out that American artists only gained access to it after World War II. It would have been difficult for Walker to own it, especially since he died in 1921. Before she arrived, I rehearsed this important opening several times and turned to her, wanting to see how it sounded. She didn't look at the picture anymore. She was looking straight at me. You really love your job, don't you? She asked. Sorry. The way you talk about her, your eyes light up. You know, it's refreshing to see someone so passionate about their craft. Yes. I like her, I said, not taking my eyes off her. Except for the part about delivering bad news, I hastily added. Actually, you seem to like this part too. I must have looked awkward because she laughed and waved her hand dismissively. Everything is fine. I love that you have a flair for the dramatic. In any case, you warned me in advance that I might not like the results. She stood up from the table and gestured to the paintings that covered the walls of my laboratory. 
Under each of them was a small card with handwritten text. She walked to the far wall and pointed to a portrait of a French nobleman. I thought you weren't a collector, she said, tilting her head. I am not a collector. They are gifts from clients. The forgeries that you exposed? I nodded. The cards say what issued them. Someday I'll get engraved labels on them and attach them properly. She walked from painting to painting, stopping from time to time to look at a few works and scan the cards underneath them. As she bent over to read the cards, I tried not to look at the fabric hugging the graceful curve of her butt. Amazing, she said. Although, I'm sorry to say, you won't get my walker. It may be fake, but I like it too much. Plus, it makes for an interesting story. She sighed. An expensive story, but an interesting one. I saw in the documents of origin how much you paid for it, I said. If I found out that I lost that amount, I would probably want a drink. I took a deep breath. Can I give you a treat? She stopped mid-reading the card, straightened up, and turned to face me. Yes, she said, smiling. I think a drink wouldn't hurt me. We sat down at a bar near my lab in Brooklyn. She ordered a martini. I took the whiskey. One drink turned into two, then three. The conversation flowed easily, and Karina's behavior gradually changed from strict and reserved to warm and playful. It was nice to watch her loosen up. Several times she reached across the table and touched me lightly, laughing at one of my jokes. Sometimes she had to lean forward to be heard over the music, and when she did this, I would sneak a few glances at her cleavage. I thought I was being discreet, but she caught me at least once because I saw her smirk and shake her head disapprovingly before leaning back in the booth. So who told me you're not the best? She asked. What? I asked, confused. She leaned forward and her blouse shifted to reveal one strap of her white bra. She paused and stared at me with a mischievous expression on her face, as if daring me to look. The day we met, she said louder. You said you knew who told me you weren't the best? Tell me who you think it was, and I'll tell you if you're right. I paused before answering. Lauren Schrader. I answered as neutrally as possible. She touched her index finger to her nose and pointed the other finger at me, as if we were acting in a play. But she was so drunk that her finger slipped from her nose to her cheek. It was charming. Why don't you like her? She asked. I didn't say I didn't like her. She laughed. Oh, no, I did. Come on, Adam, spit it out. As a matter of professional courtesy, I never speak ill of other people in my field, even Lauren, but either because of the alcohol or because I wanted to please the gorgeous woman sitting across from me, I decided to forget my manners this evening. She's just a hack. Doesn't even take his job seriously. Considers herself an unappreciated artist, just doing forensics to pay the bills until someone recognizes her genius. It's pathetic. She only got a tenured position at the Kiefer Gallery because she was sleeping with the head of the Contemporary Art Department. I drained the last glass of whiskey and awkwardly put the glass down. You wanted this job, didn't you? No, I lied. Then, seeing the expression on her face, he said, Okay, yes, but it is not bitterness that speaks here, or at least not just bitterness. Sure? No offense, but it's like sour grapes. I mean, how do you know she's even sleeping with this guy? Because I caught them. Lauren is my ex-wife. Karina's eyes widened. Uh, sorry, she said. This, in the past, I interrupted, smiling so that she could see that I was not upset. So, I asked, wanting to steer the conversation and my thoughts in a different direction, what do you do when you're not collecting original works of art? Yacht racing, cultivation of vineyards. Ah, now is the time to make fun of a rich girl, isn't it? Depends on the circumstances. Are you rich? Would a rich girl want to be seen with a Philistine like you? Oh, I said, putting my hand on my heart. She laughed. Okay, let me figure it out, I said. I am good at evaluating things. I leaned back and stroked her chin with an exaggerated movement, examining her face. You are a lawyer. No. CEO? Nope. Bank robber? She pursed her lips and touched them with her finger. Shh. Don't tell anyone. Okay.
I give up. I am a freelance graphic designer. I work at home. Yes, of course, I said dismissively. I'm serious, she protested. Most graphic designers I know can't afford original walkers. Most of the graphic designers you know probably aren't living off an outrageous inheritance from their dead parents. Damn it, I thought. I think it's my turn to apologize now, I suggested. It's not worth it. It was a long time ago. I was nine then. Nine? My jaw dropped. It must have been terrible. It was hard. I was an only child. They died in a car accident and I moved to Ohio to live with my mother's sister. She was sweet enough, but she didn't want her own or other people's children at all. She worked as a curator at a local art museum, so I spent a lot of time there, watching her work or just wandering around the halls, looking at the paintings. I got lost in these pictures. I imagined what my life would be like if I could be a part of these paintings, stretching out on the grass at a summer picnic watching ducks on the lake, exploring a rustic farmhouse in sandals with my sister, standing on top of a lighthouse and listening to the waves crash sparkling black rocks. Karina looked into the distance just above my head, immersed in memories. Then her gaze returned and met mine. That's probably where my love for art began. I'm not an expert on any particular artist, but I collect works that speak to me the same way those paintings spoke to me when I was nine. I would love to look at your collection one day, I said with sincere curiosity. How about Friday evening? She asked. There is an excellent Italian restaurant not far from my house. You buy me dinner, and then we can stop by my place and you can point out all the other fakes I unwittingly acquired. I laughed, then shook my head apologetically. Sorry, I don't like this idea. She looked surprised. Why? You have money, I said. How about you buy me dinner? Until I saw Karina, I was worried that I might have overdressed for dinner. I looked pretty dapper in a navy blazer and my best jeans, but she was absolutely stunning. Her hair was pulled back into a bun, and she wore a strapless black dress that was the perfect balance of sexy and elegant. A simple diamond pendant nestled between the swells of her firm breasts, which were the perfect size for her slender figure. Dinner was delicious, and our conversation flowed easily and freely. We tried tiramisu for dessert and then took an Uber to her house. She lived in an impressive home in Prospect Heights. Bright and open, it was decorated in a minimalist style. The few pieces of furniture she owned had smooth lines and sharp corners. There was almost no disorder anywhere. Everything seemed to have its place. Wow, you are much more careful than me. My thoughts are always disordered, she said. Sometimes I can't concentrate. And this helps me calm down. We walked around the perimeter of her living room. The walls were dotted with paintings of various sizes. Some were lithographs, but most looked like originals. It was an eclectic collection of artists, just as she had described at the bar, and it was impressive without seeming ostentatious. Is this Pissarro? I asked, stopping next to a painting of two women sitting on their knees in a grassy field and talking. Yes, she said, moving in front of me. Her hair was inches from my nose. She smelled faintly of apple blossoms. From his neo-impressionist period. Not the best example, but the best ones are well outside my price range. Since her body was so close to mine, it was difficult for me to concentrate on the conversation. What did you see in this particular work? I asked. Rather, I felt it. Connection. She connected the fingers of her hands together, pronouncing this word. The two took time away from their daily work to share something, perhaps a secret desire or dream of a different life. Babut most of the canvas depicts this vast, open space, but the work still manages to convey an intense intimacy. While she spoke, my eyes were not drawn to the picture, but to the strands of hair that had escaped from her bun and now lay tenderly on the back of her head. I moved closer to her, so close that I could almost feel the warmth emanating from her skin. Tell me, what do you see? She asked, aware of my presence, but without taking her eyes off the picture. I let her words hang in the air for a moment while I decided how to respond. Having spoken, I brought my lips a few centimeters from her ear, and the words came out 
in a whisper. I see freckles on your shoulder, I said. I see a ring of hair pressed against your neck, and I wonder what you would do if I move it aside and kiss your skin. I am surrounded by beautiful pictures, but you are the only thing in this room that I want to look at. It's been like this since you first walked into my office. I waited for her reaction, but she didn't speak or move. It seemed like she didn't even hear me. I bowed my head and gently kissed her neck, right above her back. I heard her breath catch, but she remained motionless. I trailed kisses down her neck, stopping just behind her ear. As I gently placed my right hand on her thigh, she sighed and leaned back against me, relaxed. When she didn't move away, I slid my hand up her side and touched her right breast through the fabric of her dress. At the same time, she arched back and pressed her head against my shoulder, further exposing her beautiful neck. She raised her hand and reached for me, running her fingers through my hair as I nibbled on her earlobe. My pulse quickened. I removed my lips from her neck and pressed lightly on her side. She turned to face me, and our lips found each other, hot and hungry. She broke the kiss and slipped her hand into mine, leading me down the hall through her bedroom door and then pulled me over her, collapsing onto the bed, kissing. We took off our clothes, urgently and awkwardly. Karina laughed in my mouth when I tried to unfasten my belt with one hand. Then our naked bodies pressed against each other, and the laughter stopped. My hands were everywhere, desperately trying to explore every indentation and bulge of her body at once, lingering briefly in one place and then eagerly moving on to the next. When we've satisfied each other, oh, she slid up my body until her face was level with mine and lazily ran her fingers over my chest. I have a suspicion that you came here today in the hope of seeing more than just my paintings. Perhaps I had an ulterior motive. It's okay, she said. My motives might not have been entirely pure either. She leaned her head against my shoulder and we lay together in silence, her skin warm and soft against mine. I ran my fingertips down her spine. Her breathing slowed and she soon fell asleep. I tried to let her rest, but after a while I started to get excited again and she felt it. Her eyes trembled and opened. Sorry, I said. She sighed exaggeratedly. I guess we'll have to take care of this so I can get some rest. We had gentle, leisurely sex. When we're done, Karina slipped into the bathroom, and by the time she returned, I was almost asleep. She pressed her naked body against mine and intertwined her fingers with mine. Her skin warmed my chest until our bodies were equal in temperature, and I could no longer determine where her flesh ended and mine began. It was in this pleasant absence of sensation that sleep finally took possession of me. Thanks to the fact that she lived not far from my laboratory, Karina and I had many opportunities to see each other. Since she worked as a freelancer and did not have a set schedule, she came to my office during the day, often with lunch. The job of a forensic scientist can be tiring, so I was grateful for the company. We talked about everything under the sun. One of her secret passions was travel, and with the money she received from her parents' inheritance, she was able to take some amazing trips. She saw the Komodo dragons in Indonesia, walked the halls of the Louvre in Paris, witnessed the magnificence of Iguazu Falls from the Argentine side, and explored the museums of Italy. Not to be outdone, I wowed her with photos of the majestic sphinx and towering pyramid I visited in the deserts of Las Vegas, Nevada. From time to time she asked about my work, and she did a good job of feigning interest when I discussed the intricacies of pigment analysis or showed her how to detect anachronistic fibers under a microscope. But more often than not, she did her best to get me out of the office, sometimes for a walk through the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, which is absolutely gorgeous in the spring, or to her home, where we spent a lazy afternoon in bed. Karina's frequent visits reminded me of the happy times I had early in my marriage to Lauren, shortly after we went into business together. Lauren and I would also talk for hours, and in those moments I could not believe that I was lucky enough to be doing what I loved, side by side with the woman I loved. One day, as we were finishing lunch in my office, Karina caught me looking at a picture on the wall, lost in dreary thoughts. You think about her, don't you? 
she asked. Yes, I admitted, but not because I want it. When I'm in this room, sometimes memories just pop into my head. You two must have spent a lot of time here together. It occurred to me for the first time that perhaps Karina was spending so much time in my office because she was trying to distract me not only from work, but also from memories of Lauren. Yes and no, I answered. Lauren did some testing, but mostly that was my area of expertise. Her real talent was marketing. She spent a lot of time visiting galleries in the city, trying to make connections and develop businesses. She was smart, beautiful, and persuasive. Honestly, if she wasn't so good at it, we probably would have failed. If it weren't for you, there would be no services that could be sold, said Karina. I smiled at her defense of my contribution. You're right, I said. I'm amazing. That's for sure, she said, approaching me. Look at you with your square jaw and sexy stubble. She ran her hand over my cheek, then over my chest. You are also superbly built. You know, the day I met you, I thought that you belonged on the cover of some catalog for rugged outdoor enthusiasts and not behind a microscope. Carefully, I'll get excited, I said. If it weren't for the glasses, she said, pulling them off my nose and leaning down to study my face, I would never have thought that you were a real nerd. Never mind. My pride is back to normal size, I said. You're welcome, she said, kissed me on the lips and put her glasses back on. So, what happened between you and Lauren? She asked, pinching off a crouton from the remains of my salad. Long story, I said. The short version is this. I began to pay more attention to business than to her creativity. Karina looked puzzled. How about a longer version? She asked. When we got married, we were both artists. Lauren is much better than me and dreamed of making it as an artist. For the first few years, I did everything I could to support her. He worked two jobs so she could devote more time to painting. He admired her work and helped her participate in several exhibitions. I always figured that if the roles were reversed, she would do the same for me, you know? But she didn't do it, said Karina. At first I did. Starting the business was my idea. And as I said, she worked tirelessly to help get the business off the ground. But as soon as we started getting some work, everything changed. This reduced her time for painting, and I no longer had so much time and energy to support her. The better things went for us, the more offended she became. I think she felt that I preferred my dream to hers. When she met Preston Richards during one of the stops on her marketing blitz, she was starved for attention, and he served her a fancy meal, I said. Preston Richards, asked Karina, head of the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Kiefer Gallery. Where does Lauren work now? I nodded. Lauren told him that she was an artist, and he, of course, asked to see her work. All the attention and support that I no longer provided was given to her in full by him. She ate everything. I don't know how long it took him to starve her out, but probably not as long as I'd like to believe. The funny thing is, before I caught them, I thought our marriage was getting better. I spent less time in the lab and tried to talk more with Lauren about her work. It seemed to me that this was bearing fruit. She seemed happier, started going to the gym, dressed more sexily. I even had Brazilian hair removal. Karina gave me a pitiful look. For someone who makes a living detecting fraud, you miss some pretty telling signs. People see what they want. I didn't want to see her as an adulteress. Then how did you know? I smiled bitterly. In the most banal way, I came home early. After lunch, I felt unwell and returned to our apartment to rest. Lauren was supposed to be dadding a gallery owner across town. Instead, she met Preston in our bed. Karina shook her head. And what did you do? I do not remember exactly. I know there was a lot of screaming and yelling, and at some point I hit Preston. As I later found out, he broke his jaw. I bet it was nice, Karina said. Really nice, I said, smiling. But after that, I didn't feel good for a very long time. Karina wrapped her arms around me and pulled me tightly to her. She leaned her head against my shoulder. Sorry. I wouldn't wish anyone to feel this way, I said. On the other hand, if this hadn't happened, you wouldn't be next to me now. And I can't imagine any other place where I would like to be. 
Karina looked up at me. I kissed her and she kissed me back. She broke the kiss and stood up on her tiptoes, pressing her warm lips to my ear. I know a way to help you get rid of the memories of your ex-wife that are lurking here. She sighed. Yes? Yes. She pinched my earlobe. We'll create some memories of our own. I thought the plan was good. In the months that followed, I began to appreciate all the wonderful little quirks and idiosyncrasies you discover at the beginning of a new relationship. For example, Karina hated condiments. Ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, barbecue sauce. Almost anything that added flavor to food. She was superstitious, studiously avoiding black cats and stairs, and even kept her second bedroom permanently locked only because the movers broke the mirror there on the first day. She loved musicals, but she had a terrible voice, which, unfortunately, did not stop her from humming songs from Les Miserables in her soul. One Saturday morning, while I was rummaging through the kitchen drawers for a spare USB cable to charge my phone, a mangled version of One More Day was heard coming from her bathroom. I noticed a folded brochure in the back of one of the junk drawers. The logo caught my attention because I recognized it immediately. It was a brochure for the Kiefer Gallery. I took it out of the drawer and smoothed it out onto the cool granite of the kitchen island. It advertised an auction the gallery was holding the following month. The pages were filled with glossy photographs of paintings. I was angry that Karina was interested in the auction at the gallery where Lauren works. I knew it was irrational. It's unfair to expect Karina to take my failed marriage into account when considering purchasing a piece of art. But I was upset that she never mentioned it. It looked like she was even trying to hide the brochure. It was insincere. I folded the brochure and put it back in the drawer, in the same place where I found it. I'll just pretend I don't know anything and see if she confesses. Now I was being insincere, but I didn't care. Karina came out of the shower wearing only a fluffy white towel. I stood in the living room, looking at a painting of a fisherman untying a boat from a dock. She walked barefoot on the parquet floor and wrapped her arms around me, running her palms over my chest and pressing her breasts into my back. This is one of my favorites, she said. She's beautiful, I said. All these works are wonderful. I turned to face her and kissed the top of her head. Her hair was still damp from the shower. A drop of water seeped between her breasts and disappeared under the towel. Are there any plans to expand the collection? I asked. She looked up at me. For a moment her expression changed, and I remembered how she scanned the room the day we met, her eyes seeming to take in every detail. Then her face softened. Actually, yes, she answered with a nervous smile. There are one or two exhibits that I would like to bargain for. Amazing. And when is the auction? Next month. In which gallery? She shuddered. Okay, don't be angry. She closed her eyes, took a breath, then opened them. In the Kiefer Gallery, please don't be angry, she repeated. Why should I be angry? I asked, as if it were the stupidest idea in the world. Well, I do not know. It's just, Lauren works there, and I was worried. Maybe. It doesn't matter. This is silly. I'm sorry. I should have told you earlier. Never mind it, I said. I'm glad you found something you like. I hoped that my words would calm her down, especially since I felt slightly guilty for trying to catch her in a lie, but instead she seemed even more nervous. There's one more thing, she began. If I win the auction, could you check the painting for me? I must have looked surprised because she quickly added, I will pay you, of course. I'm not asking for a freebie. It'll just make me feel better if you look at her. I wasn't sure if she was trying to soften my grievances or if she didn't really trust Lauren to do her job. It didn't matter, though. Both reasons were good. Of course, I said. Of course, since it's from the Kiefer Gallery, I'll have to charge you double. She laughed and seemed to finally relax. Then I expect your best work, she said, standing on her tiptoes to kiss me. I put my hands under the towel and ran them over the warm skin of her ass. I always do my best job, I said. I picked her up from the floor and she screamed, wrapping her legs around me for balance. I carried her to the bedroom. She grinned and loosened the towel. 
Sometimes, after finishing the initial inspection of a painting, it is impossible to get rid of the nagging feeling that something is not quite right. This is exactly how I felt after talking with Karina. When I feel this way about a painting, I'll do a second and sometimes a third pass to see if I can find anything I missed the first time. In Karina's case, I didn't know what to do. Her visits to my lab became less frequent because she was immersed in a freelance project, so I saw her mostly in the evenings. I started taking time off from work to drive past her house at random times of day. I didn't know what I expected to find. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Sometimes I would visit her unannounced during lunch. I told myself I was doing this in response to all the times she brought me lunch while I was busy. But in reality, it was just an excuse to make sure she was actually home. Karina was always happy to see me and usually invited me to stay and eat with her. I knew that my paranoia stemmed from trust issues due to Lauren's infidelity, and I was worried that if I continued down this path, I would ruin a wonderful new relationship before it had a chance to take root. This wouldn't be the first time. I decided to stop being so self-destructive. The problem is that I have never been able to stick to my decisions. One morning after leaving her for work, I walked back and took a few laps along the side streets near her house. About 45 minutes later, a man showed up at her door. I was too far away to see him. Karina opened the door and quickly kissed him on both cheeks before letting him in. My stomach grumbled, and for a moment, I thought I was going to be sick. I suppressed my nausea and told myself not to jump to conclusions. It could be a friend or relative. Secret lovers don't usually exchange European-style kisses on the cheek, I reasoned. When I go to her house, she will probably give a very reasonable explanation and introduce me. I sent her a quick text as I walked briskly to her door. Hello? I forgot my charger. I'm nearby, so I'll drop by to get him. Her answer came a minute later. Certainly. Where is it? I'll bring it to you. I don't remember exactly, just let me in and I'll find it myself. I don't want to distract you from your work. This time she did not answer immediately. Fine, let me know when you arrive. Already close, I typed. Wow. You're quick, she said, opening the door a moment later. Sorry, I should have written earlier. Everything is fine. I'm glad to see you. It's a shame you can't stay. She made a grimace. I feel lonely. Are you lonely? I asked. Yes, I'm stuck here alone, working when I could. I didn't wait for her to finish. Now I walked up the steps, jumping over one at a time. Karina had to almost jog to keep up. What happened, Adam? A note of panic crept into her voice. You never seem superstitious to me, I said. What are you talking about? About how you never use the second bedroom because the movers broke the mirror there. You're scaring me. I was already in the hallway, heading towards the spare bedroom. He is there? I asked. Adam, listen. Open it, or I'll break it. Wait a second. Wrong answer. I kicked the door. Strongly. The hinges creaked but held. Stop it, please! I stepped back and kicked again. There was a loud crack and the sound of splintering wood. I raised my foot and took aim, but before I could land the final blow, the door swung open. Standing in the doorway was a tall man with long blonde hair and a deep cleft in his chin. He looked to be about fifty. You shouldn't have knocked. I heard you. Please come in. He spoke with a French accent and gestured towards the interior of the room. I walked past him and looked around. A large window at the far end of the room flooded the space with light. Along the wall on the right side of the room stood various pieces of antique wooden furniture. Some pieces of furniture appeared to have been disassembled or cut into small pieces. In the corner on the floor lay a simple white mattress with one pillow. On the other side of the room there was a long wooden table covered in jars of various shapes and sizes. Most of them contained paint. Some contained brushes. Next to the table was a small shelving unit on wheels where extra paints were stored. In the center of the room stood a large easel with a half-finished painting mounted on it. It was a still life in the unmistakable style of Henri Matisse. Karina spoke calmly and slowly. Adam, this is Maxime. I looked at the man, then at the white mattress in the corner of the room. Karina followed my gaze. 
Maxim is not my lover, she said. He is my business partner. He specializes in purchasing. She gestured to the furniture and paints, pigments, canvas, wood, everything I need. He is the best in the world at what he does. Without him, I would be nothing. Karina smiled warmly at Maxim. She's too modest, Maxim told me. She has a gift. She can use a child's brush and paint with her fingers, creating brilliant paintings. He turned to Karina. I think maybe I'll leave you alone, huh? Thank you, Maxim, she said. He turned and left the room. I watched him leave, still too stunned to speak. Karina and I stood silently next to each other, both staring at the canvas in the center of the room. She seemed to understand that I needed time to process and process everything. The walker you brought into my laboratory, I said. You wrote it. On our first night with you, I said that my motives were not entirely pure, she said. Why did you bring her to me? Curiosity. I wanted to see if you are as good as they advertise. But besides that, I needed information. I could almost hear everything falling into place in my sluggish brain. She wanted to sell her forgeries through a gallery with the weakest forensic scientist possible. But she needed me to tell me who it was. The first time she tried to get my name out of me was in my lab. She said someone said I wasn't the best but didn't say who. I thought she was just protecting her source of information, but the truth was that she had no source. She made it all up, hoping that I would fill the void myself. At the bar, she tried again. Tell me who you think it was and I'll tell you if you're right, she said. She assumed that my answer would be someone whom I rated very low and whom she hoped would be easy to deceive. And I foolishly told her the name Lauren. And then, even more stupidly, I told her how Lauren cheated on me. When I told about this, Karina's eyes widened, but not because she felt sorry for me, but because she couldn't believe her luck. Not only did she get the name she wanted, but she knew that Lauren would never consult me about analyzing her paintings. I was furious and embarrassed at how easily I was being manipulated. Brochure, I said. You don't buy a painting at auction? You are selling it. She smiled. I felt my anger threatening to boil over. I have to call the police right now, I said. And what do you tell them? She answered calmly. That your girlfriend paints pictures in her room? Then I'll call Kiefer's gallery. I'm sure they will be interested to know that one of the paintings at their auction is a fake. They won't believe you. Why are you so sure? You said it yourself. People see what they want. Everyone wants to believe that they have found something special. It makes them feel special. My job is to help them believe it. You mean what you did to me? Tricked me into believing I had found something special? Do not say that. What you and I have is different. You know it. What we have is a mirage. Lie. We have nothing. She looked like I had slapped her. You know, Maxim was furious with me. He said I was being stupid. I'm taking too many risks. I knew he was right, but I didn't care. I wanted to be with you. As soon as I found out the name, I had to end things with you. Every day I told myself that I would do this, and every day I found excuses to see you again. Even now, part of me wants to believe that somehow this will all work out. My ego desperately wanted to believe her, but I knew she was just playing me, manipulating me again. Nonsense, I said. You stayed with me only to watch how I work, to learn how I catch others so that you don't get caught. For the first time, anger flared in her eyes. Do you think I'm an easily accessible girl? I've been having sex with you for months just to pick your brain about criminology? You're not that good. No, I'm good, she laughed. So arrogant. I don't need your help. Do you have any idea how much success I have achieved? You wouldn't even think of noticing one of my works. I already noticed. Only because I told you I thought it was fake. That's why you'll get caught one day, I said. Because you believe that you will never get caught. I turned to leave. I couldn't be around her anymore. Too many emotions were swirling in my head. She grabbed my hand. Don't go. Please. Her voice trembled slightly and her eyes filled with tears. It was a wonderful performance. 
That heartbreaking story you told me about your parents, about life with my aunt, wandering through the halls of the museum and losing yourself in the paintings. Was any of this true? Her face told me everything I wanted to know. I pulled my hand out of her grip. On the day we met, she said, I asked if you would like to know whether the painting you own was a fake. You responded that if you love the piece, you don't think it matters. Do you remember? I remember, I said. But I don't love you, Karina. The tears that had gathered in her eyes flowed down her cheeks. I left the room and started going down the steps. Where are you going? She called. I'd had enough lies for today, so I told her the truth. Away from you. I turned off my phone and spent two days in a hotel. I needed time to think, and I didn't want Karina to try to track me down. I decided not to contact the police. I might be able to convince them to investigate, but they wouldn't be able to prove anything. Besides, I was the one who wanted to catch her, and he wanted to defeat her fair and square. It seemed unlikely to me that she had someone inside the gallery working with her. This would just complicate things and introduce unnecessary risk. Besides, I was sure that Karina believed that it was easier for her to deceive someone than to pay. My next step was to determine which of the paintings she had faked. I leafed through the auction brochure I had brought with me. There were many landscapes and still lifes in it, works very similar to those that hung on Karina's walls. It seemed that she would continue to work in the same style. However, what she told me before I left kept ringing in my mind. Everyone wants to believe they have found something special, she said. I flipped to the first page of the catalog, which featured the auction's centerpiece, a recently discovered portrait of Modigliani. This can certainly be considered a find of something special. But is she really that arrogant? Modigliani was one of the most counterfeited artists of the last century, partly because early in his career, he had a reputation in Paris for selling canvases for rent. Because of this, the provenance of some of his works was difficult to trace and easy to counterfeit. As a result, any of his paintings offered at auction, especially those recently discovered, were subject to intense scrutiny. The risk would be enormous, but so would the reward. A genuine Modigliani painting could fetch millions. If this is Karina's game, then my next stop was inevitable. It was the place I least wanted to go, but where I most needed to be. Perhaps I could have made more progress with Lauren if I had told her about Karina, but that would have meant admitting that I had been dating a master faker for months without knowing it. I wasn't going to admit this shameful fact, especially to Lauren. Besides, Lauren would rather believe that I was working with Karina than that I was fooled by her. I didn't need this headache. But to be honest, I decided to remain silent because I was protecting Karina as well as myself. Despite what I told Karina in her studio, I actually have feelings for her. It's just that after the divorce, I tried so hard to close myself off from her that I wasn't ready to face her. I wanted to stop her, but I also didn't want to hurt her. The problem was that I didn't know if I could stop her. I was no longer sure that Modigliani was Karina's work. Even if I was sure, I would have to prove that it was a fake without examining it. I think best under pressure, so I decided to do something. I called Nora Turner, owner of the Kiefer Gallery, and asked for a meeting. Nora was a curmudgeonly septuagenarian who devoted her career to enhancing the Kiefer Gallery's reputation. She became one of the most influential figures in the New York art world. I knew Nora didn't suffer fools, but I also knew she cared about her reputation. She knew about my reputation and tenaciously defended the reputation of her gallery. I say that I had information about Modi Liani and that it was important that she, Lauren, and the seller's representative be present. I also asked her to be reasonable. She agreed. I made an appointment. Now all that was left was to come up with a reason for it. A week later, I was sitting in the waiting area outside the Kiefer Gallery conference room. My hands moved restlessly on my knees and my right leg bounced up and down. I couldn't decide if this was a bad idea. Usually this meant she was bad. The outer door swung open and Nora Turner walked into the reception room. She walked briskly towards me. I managed to get up from my chair just before she appeared. Mr. Weber, she said, not extending her hand but simply nodding. Miss Turner, I answered. 
thank you for organizing this. Everything is already inside. Did you tell them that I would come? No. They are both very interested in why I called this meeting. Her eyes narrowed and glared at mine. I'm curious myself. She turned on her heel, and I followed her into the conference room. She opened the door and started talking before she even entered the room. This is Adam Weber, an independent forensic specialist. Adam, I think you know Lauren Schrader. Lauren looked at me so intently that it seemed as if she was trying to melt me on the spot. And this is Georgiana Wilkes, Nora continued, gesturing to the chair where Karina was sitting, a representative of our anonymous seller. Karina rose from her chair, gave me a pleasant smile, and extended her hand. If she was surprised by my appearance, she didn't show it. Mr. Weber, Karina said in a sharp British accent, I'm very glad to meet you. I was surprised that she decided to become the gallery's liaison herself. This dramatically increased the chance of exposure. Most forgers preferred absolute anonymity. But on the other hand, Karina never lacked confidence in her abilities. Nice to meet you, Miss Wilkes, I replied, taking her hand. Are you from England? Actually from Wales. What are you saying? I've always wanted to go to Carmarthenshire to see St. David's Cathedral. Oh, it's definitely worth a trip, Karina replied. Although I'm afraid you won't have any luck in Carmarthenshire. St. David's Cathedral is located in Pembrokeshire. Certainly. I was wrong, I said, doing my best to fake an embarrassed grin. Nora gave me a few details about the cellar, so I had a chance to brush up on my geography. Karina easily bypassed my trap. Either she had done her homework too, or she was faking an American accent rather than a Welsh one. We all took our seats around the ornate conference table. I placed the manila envelope in front of me. Karina looked at him. Sorry if this sounds rude, Mr. Weber, said Karina, but I must admit that I don't really understand why you are here. That's not easy to say, Miss Wilkes, but I'm afraid that the owner of the Modigliani painting you are selling is trying to pass it off as a fake. Lauren snorted derisively. You are simply incredible, she said. Karina pretended to be shocked. That's a pretty serious charge, Mr. Weber. I didn't know you had the opportunity to examine the painting, she said, looking at Nora. She wasn't there, Nora answered, not trying to hide her irritation at Karina's accusation. He doesn't know what he's talking about, Lauren said. I am the only one who checked this picture, and she passed it with flying colors, not a single anachronistic pigment. Did you date the frame? I asked. What? Tree. Did you date him? Lauren glanced warily in Nora's direction, then pulled herself together and spoke as if she were writing an essay. Considering the results of the pigmentation analysis and the origin, I did not consider it necessary in this case. This is necessary in every case, I said, my words laced with contempt. Synthetic fibers? I continued, not giving her the opportunity to answer. Did you check to see if anything got into the paint that shouldn't be there? Certainly. I always check places for... How many places have you checked? This is ridiculous. Why? I'm sure you laid out a grid and marked each area tested so that a certain percentage could be calculated. Not to do this in such an important job would be gross negligence. So what percentage of the grid did you check? Fuck you, Adam. An awkward silence followed. I let it drag on, suppressing a smile as best I could. Do you have any evidence to support your claim, Mr. Weber? Asked Nora. Or did you just come to settle old scores? For your sake, I hope it's not the last. He doesn't have a shred of evidence, Lauren said. I'm afraid this is another example of your lack of attention to detail, I said. Remember, you showed me a photograph of the owner of the painting having breakfast? You were even kind enough to let me take a photo. I took four copies of the photograph out of my manila envelope and passed them around. As I already explained to Miss Turner, the man in this photograph is not the original owner, Karina said. He bought the portrait during a trip to Paris from a landlord who was renting out housing to Modigliani. Returning to New York, he hung it in his home for fun. He thought the extended neck looked funny. He and my client's great-grandfather were involved in business, and the painting and photograph changed hands as part of a gentleman's agreement to settle old debts. Since then, 
The painting has been kept in my client's family, but only recently have they realized its value. It is clear that they would like to avoid the attention that comes with such a find, so they decided to remain anonymous. Does the person in this photograph have a name? I asked. I'm absolutely sure yes, Mr. Weber, Karina replied, a hint of irritation creeping into her voice. Most people have a name, but we haven't found a single record of this. Of course not. I turned to Lauren. And what did your undoubtedly thorough analysis of the photograph show? Lauren looked at Nora again. This time she answered confidently, proudly listing a series of quickly spoken facts. Black and white photograph measuring 5.7 by 8.3 centimeters, shot on a Kodak Brownie 2 and printed in a dark room. The photograph shows signs of wear typical of a photograph of this age. The subject in the photo is wearing period clothing. The furniture and tableware are also period appropriate. Oh, and the subject is holding a newspaper with a date on it. I always thought it was too straightforward, I said, and I'm glad you agree. With what? She said, puzzled by my reaction to her trump card. Newspaper. It stays that way, allowing us to see enough of the front page and headline to determine the date June 13th, 1919. It's almost like it's a reenactment. She laughed. Staging because of the way he holds the newspaper? This is pathetic, Adam. Even for you. Did you know that you can buy rare and antique newspapers? I asked, ignoring her. This is a niche market. Not many places sell them. So I called them all. I looked at Karina. Her face was emotionless. I said I was looking for a copy of the New York Times dated June 13, 1919. Most said they didn't have one. But do you know what a gentleman from Seattle told me? He said, this is amazing. We never had a single request for this date, and now we have two, almost back to back. He said someone else bought it six months ago. I turned to Nora. Miss Turner, my memory is not what it used to be. Remind me when, according to you, this Modigliani came into the possession of your gallery? Five months ago. What an amazing coincidence, I said. A coincidence is hardly proof that the photo is staged, Mr. Weber, said Karina. Quite right, Miss Wilkes. Exactly, I said, standing up. However, there is something else strange about this photograph. I walked up to her and pointed to the place in the photograph that she was holding in her hands. Pay attention to the dial of the grandfather clock, I said. It says 805, said Karina. What's strange about this? Lauren asked. Nothing. I think we can all agree that 805 a.m. is a reasonable time for breakfast. Is not it so? I looked at each of the women in turn to make it clear that my question was not rhetorical. Nora nodded. Lauren shrugged. Karina didn't move. The timing seems strange to me. I continued. And here it is. I pointed the tip of my pen at the face of the grandfather clock. This ancient watch has a so-called moon dial. It's hard to see in the original photo without enlargement, so I took the liberty of enlarging it and making several copies. I took the enlarged photographs out of the envelope and passed them around the room. At the same time, he winked at Karina. As the name suggests, the moon dial shows the current phase of the moon. The dial is calibrated to make one half turn every 29.5 days, corresponding to the length of the lunar cycle. You've already said about as much, Mr. Weber. Could you get to the point? Asked Nora. Certainly. The moon and stars are convenient because they move across the sky like... I tapped my finger on the photograph. Well, like a clockwork. You can calculate the phase of the moon for almost any date, even one that was more than a hundred years ago. The 13th of June, 1919, was a full moon. One can only guess why the lunar dial on this watch shows a waning crescent. Silence filled the room. It continued to expand until it seemed like there was almost no room to breathe. Finally, Karina broke it. This is absurd. This clock can be easily stopped. Or break it. If that's true, I said, then why do they show a time that we all agreed was a reasonable time for breakfast? I looked at Lauren and Nora. Both looked at Karina. How should I know? 
Karina answered. It was a hundred years ago. Maybe the owner didn't care what phase the moon was in, or maybe he just set the dial incorrectly. I think you've hit the nail on the head, Miss Wilkes, I said. I just don't think that the owner of the watch forgot to set the dial or installed it incorrectly. I think these are falsifiers. Karina was right. I really enjoyed delivering bad news. I think you're grasping at straws, Mr. Weber. And I also think that if you or this gallery intend to slander my client with a false statement of forgery, then we will exercise our rights under the law and demand damages. Stop talking, said Nora. You will not sue anyone. I'm not convinced that the painting is a fake. There simply isn't enough evidence. I was stunned. But you're not going to sell it at auction, are you? This is my gallery, Mr. Weber. I'm sure I can do whatever I want. I looked at Karina. She smiled. However, Nora continued, rising from the table, based on the violations associated with its origin, I am also not sure that this painting is a genuine Modigliani, and I'm not going to risk the gallery's reputation because of a work that I'm not sure is authentic. She turned to Karina. I'm afraid we'll have to give up your painting, Miss Wilkes. We will remove it from auction and return it to your client, with thanks for giving us the opportunity to sell it and with our best wishes in finding another gallery better suited to your needs. Karina's smile disappeared. You understand, of course, that once you take it down, every gallery in the world will treat it as a fake, even if you don't claim that it's a fake. As powerful as I am, I'm afraid I have not yet acquired the ability to control how other owners choose to run their galleries, Miss Wilkes. All the best. With these words, Nora flew out of the room as quickly and purposefully as she had entered it. A month later, I'm almost done packing up my lab. It was amazingly emotional. I started this business from scratch and have made many memories in this building. Some good, some not so good. It was a part of me, and it was hard to leave it behind. The following week began my job as director of forensic research at the Kiefer Gallery. Nora offered me the position just a few days after we met. Obviously, our little meeting convinced her of the advisability of expanding the department. She really wanted to bring in someone from outside the gallery, as she had recently lost faith in the abilities of her employees. Nora told Lauren that she could remain under my direct command. Surprisingly, Lauren refused this generous offer and quit immediately. When Preston heard that I got the job, he also seemed to decide that it was time to move on to new places. I heard that he left New York and Lauren to start a new life in San Francisco. It's always a pity to lose good people. A week or so after our meeting, I stopped by Prospect Heights. I did not expect to find Karina and was not surprised to learn that her home had been empty for several weeks. The apartment was fully furnished and the tenant paid the first year's rent in full. There were still two months left on the contract. I took a break from packing to flip through the latest batch of resumes I received for Lauren's position. I had never had an assistant before, and I wanted to make sure I chose the right person. I may have a great eye for pictures, but I still have a lot to learn when it comes to judging people. My work was interrupted by a knock on the door. A FedEx driver left a large box on the sidewalk. I carried it to the conference table and opened it. There was a painting inside. There wasn't an ounce of protective packaging around the frame, and when I took it out of the box, I realized why. It was Walker, whom Karina drew. There was a handwritten note attached to the frame. Man, I hope it will take pride of place on your wall. This is early work, so it's a little clunky. I'd like to think I've developed a lot since then. I hope when you look at her, you will have pleasant memories of our time together. For me, it is. It's a shame you didn't have a chance to check out Modigliani. I doubt even you could find any faults. I guess we'll never know. There was some impressive work at the Kiefer Gallery, but you caught me on a technicality, so we'll call it a draw. Considering our professions, I am sure that our paths will cross again. And when they cross paths, I bet you won't know about it. I hope you prove me wrong. I like surprises. Karina, I smiled, just as arrogant as before. Only Karina could lose millions of dollars and call it a draw. I looked at the stack of pictures I had taken off the walls of my office and realized that what I had told Karina that first day was not entirely true. I was a collector after all. It so happened that I collected fakes. 
Each painting in my collection has its own story. Karina's painting was my crown jewel, Da Vinci's masterpiece of forgery, and it had the most interesting story of all. Unfortunately, I will never be able to share it. Only the two of us in the whole world know this story. But I hope that one day we will have a chance to add another chapter. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.